Welcome everybody. My name is M Coates and I am the Climate Change and Renewable Energy Week Coordinator here at EOS. Um, so I've been here since November just working to organize these events. Um, so I want to let everyone know that today's session is going to be recorded and will be posted on our EOS YouTube channel. Uh, so, and before we get started, I also want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that our work uh, EOS Eco Energy is done on the traditional unceded lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq. Letting some more people in here. <laughs> and so today we have Emma and Nigel presenting from the Bundy Biosphere region and Megan from Community Forest International. And so before I turn things over to them, I just wanna ask everyone to remain muted during their presentations. And we're going to keep question times to the end in order to stay on schedule. But if you wanna write them in the chat as we go, that is fine as well. So yeah, I will let you folks get started. So I guess I'll kind of start us off with talking about exactly what the Fundy Biosphere region is. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, me and Nigel actually have a shared presentation since we're both from the biosphere. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give a brief uh, overview on what the Fundy Biosphere region is and what we do. And then Nigel is going to kind of take over as our forester and really dive into our Forest of the Future program. Um, so kind of just a quick overlay uh, on what the Fundy Biosphere region is. So we're a greater region, as you can see in the map on the screen, we actually reach from the Sackville, uh, like, Olac area near the border all the way up to Moncton and down through Fundy Park to St. Martin's. Um, people get a little confused sometimes that we are not just Fundy Park, we're not just a small area. Um, there's no place to go to go to the Fundy Biosphere region. You're living in it, you're working in it, you're playing in it. So that's kind of a big uh, message we try to portray. Uh, we're a small team. We're located, our, our office is in Moncton, New Brunswick, um, and we work on different initiatives and projects throughout the whole region. So some of those things are more inner city um, and some of those things uh, vast all the way to Sackville and all the way to St. Martin's as well, like our Forest of the Future program. Um, so I kind of wanted to just do a quick review, uh, I guess, on what we're doing right now. Um, so we have our Make Make Trails Count project, which that's involved working with communities to um, install little like, I don't even know what that's called, like infrared scanners, I guess, um, to track how many people use trails. Uh, a lot of those are in Riverview. Um, we have some in Moncton, some in the Memram Cook and Sackville areas. Um, and we help those communities understand how many people and what times of the week, what times of the day those trails are being used. Um, so that helps, that data helps them serve the public better and serve the community better. So we have partnerships with several of of these communities to um, install those counters and also um, harvest the data and organize it and present it to them. So we kind of take on that part of the role for them to get that information. Um, another big project we do deal with as well is trash talks. So that one's a little less broad, I guess, than make trails count. Um, we focus just kind of on more the education and awareness of how we can recycle, how we can take better care of the planet. Um, the picture you see there that I use was actually from a collaboration we did with Acadia Toyota, um, where we went out uh, in one of their trucks and filled up the bed with as much garbage as we could find uh, through um, some of our amazing places. So we actually ended up going to Slack's Cove and Johnson's Mills near Dorchester. Um, fairly unpopulated uh, beach areas. So we were able to clean up a lot of trash that most people don't see. Um, and we ended up with a lot more than we expected. So that kind of goes to show how important those kind of programs are. We also do the Amazing Places project. So that kind of map that I have to the side there, that's really highlighting what that is. Um, we have 50 Amazing Places in the region and we actually started this um, initiative and now it's a nationwide biospheres take over the Amazing Places, which is kind of cool that we started it and it's kind of taking over all of Canada. Um, so these 50 places really just highlight what makes our region so important and 
why we are UNESCO designated. So there's some really cool ecological um, stuff going on in these areas. And there's also um, just amazing views, like people kind of take the Hopewell rocks, for example, into uh, not considering them to be that cool. But if you look at it on a broader scale of the world, we're the only place that kind of tidal uh, bore happens. So um, it actually is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, and oh. lastly, um, is our Forest the Future program. So I'm gonna kind of let Nigel take over the more details of that, I guess, but we're basically uh, in the process of working on uh, planting, I think about 45,000 trees in the next few years. So Nigel's gonna kind of take over, I think from there and uh, discuss more about that. All right. So I'm Nigel, I'm the Forest of the Future project manager for the Funded Biosphere. And in our area, climate change is one of the biggest threats facing our area today. Climate change has, will have varying effects on different parts of the world. For the Maritimes, climate projection models indicate the province will become warmer, wetter, and stormier. The risk of drought and other events will also increase in our area, despite getting more annual precipitation. This is because the majority of our precipitation will come from large isolated storm events instead of several smaller events. So building on some previous research, the Fundy Biosphere region helped develop a climate model that could determine what native species in our region are likely to prosper or decline in our changing climate. The Forest of the Future report used climate envelope models from the Canadian Forest Service to estimate which tree species will be able to tolerate our changing climate in the future. The report found that boreal species such as like spruces, fir, and birch will likely decline in the future due to the warming climate. Um, this is because those are more boreal species. So as the climate warms, they won't be able to stay established here. The Wabanaki forest is very unique because of its blend of boreal and temperate species. This means that most boreal species that are, are at the Southern limit of their range but our temperate species are still at the northern limit of their range. Climate change will likely result in the shrinking of the boreal forest, which could have drastic effects on the long-term species composition of the Wabanaki forest. Since the Wabanaki forest is a unique transition zone between temperate and boreal forests, it could be greatly influenced by climate change. And the forest of the future modeling suggests that our forests will become more temperate in the future as our boreal forests shrink. So here's some findings of our report. The report found that black cherry, red maple, eastern hemlock, sugar maple, red oak, white pine, and other similar more temperate species will have the best chance of thriving in our changing climate. These results are consistent with other reports that we're seeing for our general region. Research suggests that our forests will become more temperate in the future as climate change progresses. While the shift in species composition may take several years, there may be major issues as boreal species rapidly decline in the southern parts of their range, but temperate species continue to struggle to establish in the northern part of their range. This deborealization will cause a lag effect in our forests as temperate species struggle to establish. This lag effect can cause issues with reduction of habitat and biodiversity across our area. If you'd like to read the report for yourself, or if you live in the biosphere and would like some trees on your property, send us an email. We can give you some trees when our order comes in the spring. So we recently partnered with the Two Billion Trees Project. So this Force of the Future report is the cornerstone, cornerstone of our planting program. We're combining the findings from the report with our other goals and objectives to determine the best possible species composition for our planting program. So starting in the fall of 2022, we partnered with 2 billion trees to plant 45,000 climate resilient trees in the biosphere. These 45,000 trees are spread out over the next three years with 5,000 being planted in year one, 15,000 in year two and 25,000 in year three. Not only do we plant the trees, we're committed to monitoring their growth over time and making sure that we can provide the best possible growing conditions for our trees. 
We do this by manual tending at our planting sites with weed whackers and other equipment. Our monitoring program is set up to help gauge the growth of the trees at each planting site and identify any issues that we can correct to make sure we don't lose any trees. Um, our monitoring program is set up to help identify issues quickly and resolve them quickly. So last year was the first year of our partnership with the Two Billion Trees program. We planted 5,000 trees in multiple sites throughout the biosphere region. We try to plant as many different species as possible while still enhancing the climate resiliency of our area. We created multiple partnerships with municipalities such as the city of Moncton, town of Riverview, and the village of Salisbury. Out of the 5,000 trees that we planted this year, approximately 80% were native softwood species, and the remaining 20% were either bare root or potted hardwoods. And this is a chart of our, like our overall species composition for 2022. As you can see, we planted a wide variety of native species last fall. The large number of species allows us to choose the best possible species to match the current site conditions, while still contributing to the climate resilience of the Wabanaki forest. So here's some of our planting sites for 2022. Our biggest planting site was a fox farm. We planted about 3,000 trees at this site, and the property is owned by the city of Moncton and sits along the banks of, a, of the Turtle Creek Drinking Water Reservoir. As the name suggests, the site was a former fox farm. The farm itself was demolished when the city bought it, and has since been maintained and brush cut as a field. Our priority for this site was to plant a large number of trees at relatively high densities to help control surface runoff into the drinking water reservoir. Another one of our planting sites is Highland Park in Salisbury. This municipally, municipally owned park in Salisbury is very popular with bird watchers and other nature enthusiasts because it sits right along the banks of the Patagodiac River. And as a result of it being so close to the river, we chose to plant mostly silver maple because it can tolerate our, the seasonal flooding that the park gets sometimes. There's a, about 100 trees planted here in Highland Park, and we're, plant, we're partnering with Salisbury to plant more next year. Uh, the last site I'd like to highlight is just Mill Creek Nature Park. So this park in Rearview is very popular with people I'm, I'm sure most people around the Moncton area have been there before. We planted about 300 trees in this park with the majority of them being on the main sewer line that runs from the Rearview Operations Center down to the sewer treatment plant. Some of the challenges for this site were the underground, was the underground pipeline that we were planting on top of. And it was a very high traffic area for trail use. We got around this by planting only shallow rooted species and every single tree that we planted there was staked to just make sure they were visible and that people weren't trampling all over them. So overall for 2022, we planted a total of 14 different native species at our planting sites and about 50% of the trees we planted are projected to handle or thrive in our changing climate. We're hoping to increase this for next year while still planting native species and matching the right species to the right planting sites. Looking ahead for 2023, we're committed to planting 15,000 trees. Of the 15,000, 62% will be softwood plugs and the remaining 38% is gonna be hardwoods. We have increased the number of climate resilient species while maintaining enough species to be able to plant on a large, large range of sites and site conditions. We're also further expanding our partnerships with organizations within the biosphere. We're partnering with the Elgin Eco Association to plant 1,800 trees in the Elgin area. We're also working with the city of Moncton on a multi-year planting project to reforest a portion of the former landfill site on the Petacodiac River. Furthermore, we're working again with Salisbury to do a community, community tree planting event and community tree giveaway. 
So here's an estimated species composition for our planting sites in 2023. We're, maintain, we're still maintaining a very wide variety of species, but we increased our overall climate resiliency for our planting sites. Our order for next year is already placed and we're planning on planting at least 13 different native species. So we get asked a lot if we're looking at assisted migration to more temperate species. And right now we're not doing any assisted migration. We're just, we're just sticking to native species, but it may be an option in the future as more research comes out. Thanks for listening to our presentation. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions you might have about our program. And if anyone is ever in the biosphere and would like to plant some trees on their property, don't hesitate to send me an email, it's on the screen. And we also host a lot of volunteer planting events. So keep an eye on our social media if you'd like to volunteer for some of our planting events. I think that means that I'm up. So I'm really grateful that Nigel covered some of the some of the, the, the basics and the really important points of the relationship between the climate change projections for the region and the forest type here. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and then and, and talk some about uh, some of the strategies that we take as an organization. So I'm Megan DeGraff. Um, I'm the director of the forest program for Community Forests International. And uh, I'm physically located in what's called Southern New Brunswick between Sussex and Moncton in the overlap territories of the Wulistigwe and Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, so a quick word about Community Forests International. We're, uh, as the name suggests, an international organization that was established by a handful of maritime or tree planters back in 2008. And we actually work in two places on the globe. We work in East Africa and in Eastern Canada. And in East Africa, we work um, in Tanzania and Mozambique. And so this photo that you see here is an image of um, Pemba Island, <clears throat> which is one of the islets in the Zanzibar archipelago, which is off the coast of Tanzania. And no matter where we work, our, our, our mission is the same, that we work with communities and forests together so that they may thrive. And um, we do a lot of really great things in, in Tanzania and Mozambique, and I have very little to do with them. We have a, a great team of 18 staff people um, in East Africa who do those programs with some support from a couple of my colleagues here. So if you have questions, I probably won't do a very good job of answering any of them when they come to that, that program area, but I do encourage you to look at our website. Uh, where, where I do work <clears throat> is on our forest programming here in Eastern Canada. And so it's worth um, kind of picking up uh, on some of the stuff that Nigel said. We work in the Wabanaki forest region, and uh, some of you may know that as, by another name as the Acadian forest. We've taken to calling it the Wabanaki forest to recognize the Wabanaki Confederacy, which is an assemblage of five indigenous nations whose territories cover approximately the same area. And so, as you can see from the map here, it covers the maritime provinces, a little bit of Gaspé, and parts of the New England states all the way into northern New York state. Also, as Nigel mentioned, there are some, uh, there are some really interesting um, features about this forest region. It is a blended forest type, so it's a blending of trees found typically in the boreal forest, those would be more cold adapted tree species, as well as the, some that are found more to the south of us in the northern hardwoods forest. Hi, Megan. So sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. The slideshow is not moving for the rest of us, so we can just see the title slide. So if you were showing wow. us the map, we can't see it. Okay. What I'm going to try and do is um, stop that share and try again. We'll see if that works. Okay. Great idea. So can you see now a map instead? It's still loading, so just give it a second, and then I can let you know. I can't see anything right now. Did you stop screen sharing? <laughs> it kicked me out and I'm going to try again. <laughs> How about now? This should be a map. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, let's think, keep our fingers crossed that we don't get any more <laughs> glitches. 
So were you able to hear me talk about the map though when I was describing? Yes, we could okay. hear you, we just couldn't see. Great. Okay. Well, you didn't miss a lot. I mean, it's a map. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too exciting. Um, and hopefully everything that I said is fresh enough that you can kind of catch up a little by seeing it now. Um, so some interesting features of this forest region are that uh, because of that composition, that mixed forest type, plus its proximity to the ocean, means that it tends to be in its natural and pre-colonial condition, it was very fire resistant. We typically have not until maybe as soon into the future or quite recently, we haven't really worried about major fires here. And as a result of that composition and that fire resistance, it's also quite a carbon dense forest. It's very, uh, it's quite rich that way. Um, it has high species diversity. So it has uh, at least 32 different tree species, na native tree species here, and hundreds. I'm not sure why we picked up on the 225 bird species, but it, it is a very rich region with a lot of biodiversity. And then another interesting feature, and I'm just talking about the, the Maritimes now, is that in the Maritimes, at least, about 40% of the land base is, in quotation marks, owned by uh, individual citizens. So land stewards or landowners who would have in their in their control you know 100 or 50 or 300 or 1000 acres and that's uh atypical for the rest of canada um so this should be a fairly you know fairly familiar image for most people who are from the region this is what the sort of this mixed Wabanaki forest looks like. And just to recap very quickly on something that Nigel said, you know, because of that blended forest type um, with its cold adapted boreal forest species and its more southerly adapted uh, northern hardwoods species, it, it has some characteristics of both forest types. And it also has, you know, some vulnerabilities to climate change because climate change is projected to become warmer and wetter overall. And in fact, uh, we're supposed to receive more precipitation, but the increase in something called evapotranspiration as a result of that increased he heat means that we will overall be generally drier. So we're we're going to experience more droughts in the future um, on top of those uh, intense rain and snowfall events that Nigel mentioned. So, you know, the chaos that we can ex we've seen and can continue to see <laughs> uh, means a few things for the forest. Nigel mentioned some species that are, are projected to do well and some that are projected to, to do poorly. This, um, you, you'll probably see exactly some of the content that Nigel already described in the report that they created uh, right there in the first or second column of this table. But this table overall is a, is, a, is a compilation that I pulled together from three different research projects, one of which was the Biosphere Regions project from a few years ago, plus two others, and to come to some um, you know, some cohesion across the, across those three reports. And generally, they agree that the, the those cold adapted boreal species are projected to decline. It's not looking good, especially for balsam fir and white spruce. And then uh, some of the more uh, southerly adapted species, of course, are likely going to do okay. Now, there are, uh, you know, a few exceptions. Eastern hemlock is likely to experience declines in the region once hemlock woolly adelgid spreads. Similarly, emerald ash borer, which is an insect, has reached the maritimes and is devastating now our ash trees. So there are a few, there are a few challenges yet, even for those species that are considered generally more resilient. But if you wanted to sort of bank on the top three, those would be red oak, red maple, and white pine, just so you know. Um, what does this mean for climate overall? I mean, this is a, a fairly typical picture also from the region. It, we've, we have collectively spent the last, getting into forest management here, we've collectively spent the last 70-ish um, years uh, systematically growing a certain suite of species or, or in uh, trying to shape forest management to promote a certain number of species that are timber focused species or, or prized for their timber anyway. And, and those timber, those timber species tend to be boreal affiliates, which is a, is bad news, right? <laughs> so if, if we had been set the challenge of um, crafting the least climate resilient version of the forest here, we would have excelled because we now have an overrepresentation of species like balsam fir and white spruce on the landscape, certainly much higher than in pre-colonial uh, conditions of the, in the pre-colonial condition of this forest. And so 
that's a real challenge because we have now a forest that is quite vulnerable to the effects of climate change, which brings me to the, the meat of some of the work that we do, which is in trying to reverse that trend and enable um, forest stewards in the region, both settler and indigenous, to work with their forests to, to kind of course, course correct on, on this trajectory. Um, and of course, you know, that's important for us humans, but it's also important for all of the other uh, thousands and thousands of individual beings and taxa that live in this forest region, like this nice little salamander. So in terms of the work that we do, um, we, I've broken it into a few baskets uh, and that the first one is sort of in this basket of nature-based climate solution solutions, sorry. That's an, a, a term that some of you probably have heard in the last few years. It's kind of a, a, a buzzword. And uh, one of those nature-based climate solutions, there are many, including tree planting, which I'll talk about a little later. But one of the, the nature-based climate solutions that's really uh, prominent is that of forest carbon offsetting. And uh, when people hear about nature-based climate solutions, they sort of assume that's that's it, although there are several others. So, but that is the one I'm going to talk about <laughs> because that's uh, that's been the, the meat of some of the work that we've done over the last decade. So we've we've been working for a decade to do the R and D on forest carbon offsets for this region to figure out how they can be done well and how they can be done authentically and how they can be done with that 40 percent or more of the rural family folks here in the region, how they can benefit and access those programs. And so we created one of the first forest carbon offsets projects east of British Columbia back in 2012. And we've continued to do the R&D and de-risking of that, that work for others. And so I'm happy to report that uh, last year in 2022, we were able to launch our first pilot project for other uh, land stewards. And that's running right now for a year while we collect data and, and test it out. And uh, that particular pilot project has 63 family forest owners in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick who are collectively in charge of 65,000 acres of land. Uh, so they, and they range from small, medium, large. So some people only own, you know, 75 acres or something. And the biggest couple, there would be a couple that have quite large acreages, you know, over 5,000 acres, but in total 65,000. And uh, altogether, we expect to return about $480,000 to those, to those 63 families. So not inconsequential money. So that's just one example, you know, and, and to make the fun, put kind of put the final point on this, what's really important is to be able to create and find these meaningful alternatives to current timber markets and to to put those and make those viable for the people in the region who have control over so much forest land, because without those alternatives, uh, clear cutting is the, the default and the most lucrative and often, um, sadly, the one that many people have to turn to, not necessarily out of choice either. So we're, we're really invested in trying to figure out how we can make conservation a day job. Uh, I know that that text is a little bit hard to see because uh, the contrast isn't great, but what it says is provide resources, training, and tools for climate-focused forest management. So we've spent the last decade, you know, really digging into how you, how you do carbon, how do you do that, and also how do you do climate-adaptive silviculture? How do you do climate-focused climate, climate -focused forest management? And so it's, it's important to engage with landowners and land stewards, but it's also really important to engage with forestry professionals. And so we have an entire program area where we work with uh, forestry professionals like the ones in this photo to do things like, in this case, uh, train them in how to inventory forest carbon. Because if forestry professionals in the region don't know how to do that, then, uh, then we're going to be lagging quite badly as carbon projects in particular come to the region. And so what you see here is a handful of foresters and forest technicians on the south shore of Nova Scotia who participated in one of our workshops last November. And where we, we trained them up in uh, that, that inventory method for, for uh, forest carbon. And we continue to do that work. Uh, another example of the same sort of thing. Sorry. Zoom's lagging a little bit. Hang on. 
So another example is in, as I mentioned, climate adaptive silviculture. So we, we partnered up with Gareth Davies at the Maritime College of Forest Technology, if anybody knows him, really, really smart guy. And uh, he and I to, developed this great uh, suite of materials, including a decision tree, like the one you see right in front of you in the hands of the guy with the hard hat. And um, that is another tool for, for forestry professionals. And when I say forestry professionals, I'm really referring to folks who work want, who work in close proximity to landowners. So these would be people who work for the forest products marketing boards, the woodlot associations, um, and some of the some of the, the technical and university uh, institutes. So in this case, the civil culture decision tree is a tool for the forestry professional where they can go into a stand and uh, work through the decision tree to evaluate the climate change riskiness of that stand, and then work through to an appropriate climate focused forest intervention. And what that means is to work through to a, a an intervention, some sort of harvest or not, some, some sort of treatment that um, one increases the climate change resilience of that stand over time, two increases the carbon storage capacity of that stand over time. And as a, as a side benefit, uh, it should, in, in most cases, should benefit biodiversity as well. And you'll notice I didn't say timber anywhere in there. Timber is considered a byproduct. It's not a goal of this, this work that we do. So that's just another example of the training that we do for forestry professionals. Um, and back to landowners for a second, we, we created a series of videos. So some of you folks on this, on this webinar today might be interested in watching our Changing Forest video series, which is available through our um, website and YouTube channels. And uh, that series of videos uh, also features Gareth Davies, whom you see there. And uh, it, it really covers a lot of the material that I just described over the last few minutes and provides some, some good actionable material for, for landowners and land stewards. We also think it's really important not, not just to think about these things and to like innovate uh, those kinds of solutions, but to also demonstrate them and, and test them out on the ground. And so our demonstration work really falls into three categories. Um, this is really us trying to walk the talk of the all the talk <laughs> that we do. But the first one is, um, hang on, <laughs> is old forest conservation. Now, you might not think immediately that that's really uh, like climate focused forest management, but it really is uh, because we like most of the land trust in the re land trusts in the region really do believe that, you know, that tiny percentage of the land base that is still in in old an old forest condition really is doing the heavy lifting for us and the climate, right? They're already doing the hard work. They're acting as refugia for biodiversity. They're acting as huge sinks for carbon. And to lose those is a blow for the, for the fight against climate change. And so we do actively purchase and conserve old forests because they need to be protected. And we can learn so much from old forests in the rest of the work that we do. Um, and when I say conserve, I don't mean uh, hands off because there are, you know, many old forests that are nonetheless in a precarious condition for whatever reason. And so we do sometimes intervene and do some harvesting in those forests, but only only ever when it's uh, sort of necessary and when when we think that it's a there's a, a critical climate or other need to do so. So just as an example, this is a hemlock forest. I mentioned hemlock woolly adelgid is an it's an insect pest that's moved into the region in south in southern Nova Scotia right now, and we we anticipate that it'll move you know into a lot of the some of the forests that are are in our care. So it's not outside the realm of possibility at all that we might intervene and harvest some of the hemlock and try to transition some of those stands to more a more mixed condition so that they're more resilient over time, just as an example. This is the really fun stuff, though. This is the middle ground, right? This is the, the, the really interesting things, th stuff that we do. So for those forests that aren't old, and they're not recent clear cuts that need to be replanted, the, they are, and th so that's a lot of land, right? That's 80 something percent of the land base or something that's been uh, harvested in the past or is an old field that's grown up or it's some other sort of degraded forest. We undertake climate focused forestry and we use the, the tools that we've developed in fact to, to do that work. So we test them out. So this is just a couple pictures from 10 years apart uh, from our carbon offsets project site, Welgenbrand Forest, which is just outside of Sussex. And uh, in the, the back picture is from a harvest we did in a uh, old 
old field site that had grown up in um, white spruce largely with a little bit of larch and jack pine and um, or not larch sorry just jack pine and the occasional white pine that had been super canopy white pine that that kind of hung around along the edges and the margins of this old field site and uh, we were we what we tried to do and we I think we were successful is we chose to remove about 30 percent of the overstory uh, so that it would open up enough to release the baby white pines that had seeded in from those marginal big super canopy white pines because white pine is a climate resilient species and white spruce is very much not so and now if you go back this this like I said this was in 2013 so now when you go back you can see chest face and beyond high white pine that have really sprouted up beautifully and uh, we're due to return into that site another time not not too, in the not too distant future <laughs> to, to do another entry of some kind and then as another example we undertook in the corner picture what's called an expanding gap shelter wood and that we did um, last summer also at the same uh, same property but a different stand and in that stand it was also an old pasture site but it was more mixed had a lot of um, balsam fir and some white spruce and then a a smattering of other minor species so generally quite unresilient but the smattering of other species was interesting those were more resilient species like this yellow birch that you see here and so what we did was uh we did an expanding gap shelter wedge, which i can talk about later if you want and um what we hope to do with that is because we left reserve trees anything that was climate resilient got left alone those will seed in into these little gaps and then because the site is also located downhill from a red oak stand, we're hoping that the red oak will will populate all of these sites as well. And we successfully ended up um, doing something called breaking up the canopy. So across the entirety of the stand, we now have much more structural diversity coming in because we've changed the, the cohorts and the age structure of the stand. OK, that was quite technical. La I'll just mention here that another thing that we do is restoration planting. So of course we clear we uh, purchase clear cuts. We don't advocate for clear cutting of course, but there's an awful lot of it around um, just out of you know out of necessity sometimes. And uh, we so we purchase clear cuts, we replant them with a mix of Wabanagi forest species. And uh, to date we've managed to plant about uh, 1.3 million trees and we're on schedule to plant 500,000 trees a year for the next three or four years. And so uh, we currently have in our care some, I think it's about 2,800 acres across the across the Maritimes that are these restored forests. And once once they've been replanted, they enter into that pipeline of the previous slide, where they enter into our climate resilience pipeline, where they're they're managed going forward for climate resilience, carbon storage, and we ensure because we own them as a charity that they're never clear cut again. My last little section here is just to talk about uh, some of the absolutely the most exciting work that we're doing. And that is um, in supporting indigenous led conservation and nature based reconciliation, because uh, we really believe that there's no lasting solution to the climate crisis that doesn't include climate justice. And that doesn't include, um, you know, breaking free of some of the, the past preconceptions and shackles of the past to really uh, build new relationships. And so we are um, very uh, very authentically or very openly exploring co-management and even land back for the properties in our care. So it's very possible that in the future, uh, some or all of our properties will return to the their rightful caretakers. And uh, it's some of the best work that we're doing. It This all falls under the big basket of our common ground work. And so uh, if you're curious about learning a bit more about that big program area where we're doing some of that work, you can look at our or listen to our podcast that we created last year. I got to talk to some really cool people. And, um, you know, we, we do a lot of forest walks and workshops with settler and indigenous groups to try to create that common ground and bridge bridge the space because we do think that there are that those two groups of people have a lot in common. They have a lot of differences, but of course there are lots of things in common that we may not all think of when we think of um, this kind of area. Okay, I think that was it. And uh, yeah, I welcome any questions. I think I think we can have a good discussion. 
Yeah, that was great. Uh, before we move on to questions, I'm just going to copy and paste a link into the chat. Uh, we have a little workshop evaluation form that we like to ask folks to do at the end of our webinars. So you don't necessarily have to do it now. Just if you get a chance, we would really appreciate the feedback on how we can improve, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, and yeah, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, the first one, Debbie wants to know if a butternut canker is a concern when making a choice of what trees to plant. So it, it is a concern for us. That's why we're not planting like a very significant amount of butternut. Um, we're trying to get around it by planting butternut in more isolated patches around and mixing it in with others. So it's not just one contiguous patch of butternut. And we also marked each butternut that we planted so we can go back and monitor it more extensively than the other ones. Okay, great. I think the next question would be for the, the biosphere as well. Um, Kate wanted to know why there was so much uh, white spruce, I'm assuming in the, in the graph, if it isn't projected to do well in the changing climate. Uh, for for like this past planting year, it was more a matter of choosing the right trees for the right site. And I I thought the white spruce would be the right would be better than the other alternatives that we had on hand. And its seedling avail availability of climate resilient trees is was an issue for us last year, so we're making that better for this coming year. Um, do you mind if I jump in there too, just to? To weigh in because uh, this is something similar that we deal with with our planting sites, and um, you know when you're when you're mass planting thousands of thousands of trees, uh, as Nigel said, sometimes you don't have a lot of choice in this tree species that you can get your hands on because most of the nurseries in the region have been quite focused on producing those timber species, but um, so getting getting trees in the ground is really important but in our case we don't uh we're not I, and i don't know what if this is the case with you folks nigel but we're not particularly attached to those specific trees once they are in the ground um so we we do um we we care about the overall species composition of that site and if if it so happens that a white spruce is planted right beside a red maple sucker even though the white spruce is the planted one we might later come back in 10 or 15 years and make the decision to, you know, call the white spruce in favor of letting the red maple survive because it's more climate resilient. And so we're pretty open about that too. We, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't try to um, flim flam anybody about that. Yeah, great. Um, Emma had also posted in the chat that she would love to have some more resources to hear about Community Forest International's work in Tanzania. So if you have any that you'd like to share, that would be great. I, I'll just direct you to our website, which yeah. I will type into the chat. Yeah, there's a lot of great material. You could also, of course, follow us on social. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, probably some others that I don't know about. <laughs> I think that's all the questions that I see in the chat. So if anybody wants to jump in either with their microphone or in the chat, please feel free to ask some questions. There we go, now we're getting some. <laughs> if uh, New Brunswickers who burn hardwood to heat their homes lose their suppliers because those harvesters are joining the climate initiative, how do you deal with this? Yeah, I think um, you're, you're getting at a really interesting question here, um, maybe more broadly than just firewood producers or the availability of firewood is really the question of traditional markets. So, you know, that question, I think, could apply equally to, say, firewood as it could to, um, you know, saw, saw, like saw logs or, or pulp or anything like that. And um, the important thing to know is that for those carbon offsets initiatives, or at least the pilot that we're running, uh, it, it can't exist in absence of, mar of traditional markets because you, you have to have some other um, sort of traditional markets to be compared against. And so there will always be like a, 
a very careful interplay between the prices of things in those traditional markets versus the price of things for carbon offsets. And um, some of the most exciting work that I'm looking forward to digging into is uh, assisting a landowner to figure out how they can make the, the best of everything. You know, how can they time their interventions so that um, they can generate some firewood or they can still sell a load of logs to the market, but they can also enjoy uh, rolling in and out of carbon programs as appropriate because there is a place for them uh, for all of those things, right? We don't want to lose access to firewood. Um, and it, I'll also mention that not all carbon offsets projects are the same. Like there are quite a variety of different types of projects. And in particular, the one that we're piloting is actually, it's not a true carbon offset. It's actually a harvest deferral credit. So you get paid for deferring some or all, not all necessarily, but some or all of your harvesting for one year. And so if you are uh, an engaged landowner who knows your forest and, and works, you know, has a working forest, you, you, sh you would get to a point or you would be savvy enough to say, oh, okay, well, I know, I know the price for, I know the price for poplar is really good right now. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to schedule a harvest of this poplar stand over here and exclude that from the carbon offsets program and roll into the carbon offsets program, but exclude that poplar so that I can still harvest it. And in that way, you still have uh, climate benefit, but you also have landowners engaging in traditional markets at the same time. Yeah, great answer. Um, Kate wants to know if either CFI or Fundy Biosphere plants trees from seed. We don't, we don't plant any trees from seed. We're all just seedlings. Same here. Okay, perfect, simple enough. <laughs> and uh, Julia had a question for the biosphere. She said she has heard some rumors. Um, weren't you making an app for landowners to plan their sites slash land management and how can folks get your trees? Is it free? So we, we were in the process of making that app. We're kind of in the middle of a rebrand right now. So we're, we're still working on it. It's coming eventually. And Right now, if anyone just wants to send me an email, I'll make sure we can get some trees. Our order's already placed and I'm just in the process of allocating it all. So if anyone would like trees, send me an email and yes, they're free. I think you just made her very happy. <laughs> Um, Brittany says, fantastic presentations and incredible work that you're all doing. What are the projects and partnerships in the area looking like for both groups? Any Tantramar planting slash room for partnership? So, well, uh, other than the ones I outlined in my presentation, there's a couple other partnerships going on and I'm always trying to get more partners involved with our tree planting. I did reach out to Sackville, but I haven't heard anything back from them yet. So if anyone in the Sackville area wants some trees, send me an email. I'll send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just really quickly. I mean, we our office is based in Sackville, so our home is uh, the Tantramar region. Um, so we do have like, a, you can picture it sort of concentric circles of partnerships around the Sackville area, right? So the farther afield you get from us, the bigger the you know, sort of the wider the circle is or whatever. But um, we are a regional organization, so we do tend to have partnerships building kind of all over the place. Um, but we have some we have some close friend friend organizations in Tantramar that we work really closely with. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for today? Julia, are you waving because you have a question? <laughs> I am. I just, uh, I feel like I know quite a few landowners who would love to get more involved. And I think they're curious about, you know, first steps, next steps, like whether or not they want to be part of a community land trust, or they just want to have climate resilient species on their site, or they are tired of um, the only way they can get money from their land is clear cutting. Um, or the only, you know, the only contract workers they can get on site would love to do more climate resilient work, but they only know how to clear cut um, or clear cut equivalent. So I'm just wondering what are the first steps and like how could people get involved in making their own parcels of land and woodlots uh, to be climate resilient and part of climate solutions? 
Um, I can offer a few suggestions. Uh, so I think the first first thing I would do is is um, once again refer people to our our changing forest video series because that contains both general region sort of detail about climate and forests and the forests here, but also then specific action related activities that landowners can take um, in in their own on their own lands when it comes to their forests. And uh, you touched on a really important point there, I think, Julia, about contractor capacity. So there is there is a significant lack of contractor capacity in the region, I, either number of people who are available to do harvesting or the type of harvesting that you want done in the region. And that's, that's across all of the Maritimes. We hear it from everyone. But um, we increasingly are, are working, we have been for many years, working with the local marketing boards and wood co-ops across the three maritime provinces to um, build their expertise in climate focused forest management. And they are naturally like a, they are a great link to contractors. Like usually each of those wood co-ops will have one or two or three preferred contractors that they've done, you know, they know will do good work or whatever. And we're, we're starting to build that pipeline of con of increasing contractor capacity for climate focused management too. So that's that's a new program area that we'll be moving into probably next year, including some training for contractors, not just forestry foresters and forest technicians. But if there is a landowner on this call who's really keen to, to jump in, I would say find out who your closest marketing board or wood co-op or whatever is and, and get get to be friends with them. Get a management plan, stick to your goals and your objectives and make those clear and you can you can get what you want you just have to work a little for it that's all <laughs> thanks so much. yeah and we just have a, a comment in the chat here from kate for julia she suggests that you become a member of the new brunswick federation of woodlot owners who are also a great source of resources so if you don't know about that already it's a little suggestion there Oh, we got more. They offer workshops, resources, trees through two billion trees, and might soon have foresters who can come and give advice that is non-harvest related. Thank you. <laughs> and I know also I keep hearing from a lot of millennials and younger that they also feel like they will never own land, but they would love to get involved in saving the forest. <laughs> Oh, that's a, not to monopolize questions, but I would love to know, like, what are ways that students um, and younger folks can help uh, support your projects and, yeah, and the climate resilience of the Wabanaki Forest and also promote the biosphere? I feel like people don't know that we're in a UNESCO designated amazing space. So, yeah, I would love to know something about that. We, we do have a bunch of planting events that we're hoping to do this year, so you'll if you follow us on social media and stuff, we'll, we'll put that out there and you can come and volunteer with us and plant some trees. Um, I'll, I'll also mention um, that there are a couple of really interesting organizations in the province, well, in the, in the Maritimes, that um, have taken an, like an alternative, they're, they're trying out alternative models of land ownership, I guess you could call it. So. For example, there's the, um, I'm going to butcher the name of this, the um, South Knowlesville Trust Land Community Community Land Trust, I think. And so that's an example you could go check out. That's an opportunity for, I think, people who have not the resources to go buy 100 acres themselves to still have access to forest land and have a small parcel for your to build a house and to have, you know, your own space and plant gardens and whatever. And that's the kind of model that the South Knowlesville Trust folks are, are um, piloting or have been doing for a few years now. So there are a few of those like coming and in, coming into the region and different parts of the Maritimes. So I think, oh, thank you, Julia. <laughs> I appreciate you dropping that in there. Anyway, that's the, that's the kind of thing that I think um, people who don't have a lot of resources might find interesting. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any further questions before we wrap up? If not, I will just 
paste that link to our little feedback survey once again in the chat. And if you have an extra five minutes in your day, we would really appreciate you all giving us some feedback. Thank you so much to Community Forest International and Funny Biosphere Region. The phone is ringing. Uh, <laughs> for uh, presenting today. I've been really pleased with how it turned out. And um, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say that I learned a lot 